Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us on our second webinar on the role of inflammation in psychosis. Uh, my name is Giuliano Tomei, and I'm one of the research assistants working on the PP2 and SYNAPS2 studies. And I will share uh, the first part of today's webinar, uh, while my colleague Isabel Arizon will share the Q&A session. Uh, before I hand over to today's speaker, um, I would like to give a brief reminder about the program for today. So we will have a 20 minutes presentation from today's speaker, followed by a 10 minutes uh, Q&A session. Uh, all attendees uh, will be muted to avoid background noises, so please feel free to use the, um, the Zoom chat to send your questions during the webinar. Uh, should we not manage to answer all of your questions uh, during today's webinar, uh, we will collect them in a document which we will distribute by email in a few days' time. Uh, also, please note that all the webinars will be uploaded on the YouTube channel and on our website and will be freely available at any time. So, um, moving on, I'm pleased to introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Alasdair Coles, a Professor of Neuroimmunology at the University of Cambridge and SYNAPS2 Chief Investigator, who will give a presentation on the effects of autoimmune system treatments on psychosis. Uh, Professor Coles, over to you. Uh, well, good morning, everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure to see you. Can I ask uh, Giuliano to wave at me if he can hear me and see me? Uh, yes, I can see you. Good. Terrific. That's great. So <clears throat> I'm a neurologist, and my confession for today is I don't know a great deal about psychosis, as may well become clear. Um, but this uh, adventure that I've been on with my colleagues in the PPIP to and the synapse to uh, community has been a, a very exciting and educational rewarding one for me learning about this illness or this group of illnesses. So um, what I wanted to do was start off by discussing a case and um, we'll come back to this at the end. So this is a, a real case I was on call uh, would you believe, in scrubs during COVID time uh, on uh, the weekend. And this is a case I dealt with. So a 24-year-old woman um, who was a very kind of straightforward lady uh, up until a few weeks ago with no previous psychiatric or medical history, uh, holding down a good job, just got married, everyone, you know, everyone happy, hunky-dory. Um, fasting for Ramadan as per usual and started to say some odd things. And <clears throat> from four weeks, she went from being very normal uh, to being admitted to a local uh, acute hospital uh, where she was said to have a psychosis, uh, being moved to a local psychiatric hospital under section where her behavior became so difficult and aggressive and violent she had to move uh, several hundred miles away to an instant, a psychiatric intensive care hospital uh, where she was not eating or drinking uh, and so had to be admitted back to an acute hospital setting, i.e. Uh, my local hospital uh, and to be faced with me. Uh, and on examination, uh, there were no special signs. Systemically, she was fine. Um, from a physical point of view, uh, but she was extremely unwell from a psychiatric point of view. She was mute. Uh, she was aware of her surroundings, it seemed, but otherwise completely unresponsive. Uh, and she was catatonic, uh, holding her arms uh, in whatever posture you left them in for hours on end. And that is the case. So I don't know what you think as you, you heard that, um, one of the questions that traditionally uh, a neurologist like myself would um, be trained to ask of a case like this is, well, is this an organic psychosis or is this a primary psychiatric disorder? Uh, and more and more, I find this to be an unhelpful question to ask. 
Um, it's unhelpful at several levels. So you may take, you know, a philosophical point of view that this is unhelpful because it proposes a dualist model. Uh, and there's a whole kind of argument around that. Um, you could say it's unhelpful because um, all the psychosis means in this context is a set of behaviors and symptoms. And if you change the words a little bit, you'll see how just bonkers it is. So if I said, is this an organic um, chest pain or a primary chest pain, uh, that would uh, mean almost nothing. Wouldn't it? So I think the most useful question that we can ask is, is this, uh, uh, is this person best treated with antipsychotics or antipsychotics with another sort of treatment? Uh, and in the topic uh, we're addressing today, that other sort of treatment would be an immunological treatment. So I think that's a useful question to ask. Um, and uh, that kind of divides into two uh, broad uh, propositions. The first is that you might believe that any person presenting with an acute psychosis, psychosis should be given immunological treatments. And so we just crack on with this lady and passionate exchange her, give her IVIG, steroids, the whack. Or you might say, well, maybe there's a subgroup of people who present like this who would respond to immunological treatment. And if so, what tests are there that could tell us uh, that she would? So let's just address the first of those. So um, is it a reasonable position? to say that all cases of acute psychosis should be giving immunotherapy. Well, at one level, it clearly isn't a reasonable position because this is not the orthodox approach. Uh, and I personally don't subscribe to this, but it's interesting, as I'll show in a second, just how many people do. So obviously there's been a hint um, over the decades since schizophrenia and psychosis were uh, defined and categorized that there might be some immune component uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with with this or variants of this evidence so uh, there's a slightly increased risk of other autoimmune diseases in people with schizophrenia and um, it may be that if you have autoimmune disease and you have an infection at some point there's an increased risk of schizophrenia um, and you may be aware that very simple treatments of the immune system seem to have an impact on psychosis. So here is uh, the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, i.e. things like paracetamol and brufen that you can buy over the counter. Uh, in one small study, appear to show that if you use those for whatever reason, there's a less chance you'll get psychosis. There's even been trials of this approach uh, here in mania, showing that non steroidals have a modest impact. Uh, and then here's a, a trial of uh, anti inflammatory treatments now, of, uh, sorry, a series of trials of anti inflammatory treatments in depression, um, and depressive psychosis, showing a modest effect. And um, if you look up the current clinical trials listings on say clinicaltrials.gov, you'll come across quite a few trials now um, of um, really quite powerful immunotherapy drugs in unselected cases of psychosis. So uh, methotrexate is a drug that uh, I will put in the moderately risky category. Um, and that's being trialed in unselected cases of acute psychosis in the States. Um, Rituximab, which is definitely towards the riskier end of the immunotherapies, uh, as we'll hear about, is uh, being used in patients with psychosis in North America who have some other evidence of autoimmunity, which can be really quite slight. Ocrelizumab, which is uh, the daughter of rituximab, so this is a uh, monoclonal antibody that depletes B cells, again, moderately to significantly risky, um, is being used in patients who have a psychosis that's acute that's just very severe um, and uh, in this study 
steroids are added to conventional antipsychotic treatment in anyone with an early psychosis, and so on. And there are several of these. So there clearly are um, people uh, and units and ethics committees around the world who believe that it is reasonable to expose people uh, with psychosis relatively unselected uh, in a clinical trial where they might receive uh, one of these quite powerful immunotherapies. Uh, however, um, I'm not convinced that this is uh, a good general approach um, and I certainly uh, wouldn't take the attitude in the patient that I've discussed. We should go straight from that presentation to giving immunotherapy. So the much more interesting question, I think, uh, is are there subsets of people who present with psychosis who respond to immunotherapy? And the answer to that is most definitely yes. So um, obviously you can open Lishman's textbook and see pages and pages of diseases that present biological organic diseases, if you want to use those terms, that present with psychosis. Uh, and I thought that that's not terribly helpful. Uh, so I actually made a list here of the um, brain diseases uh, which I have seen which present uh, with psychosis that have responded to immunotherapy. And here's the list. And as I drew up the list, um, I kept thinking there's one I've forgotten. And uh, just before giving this talk, I suddenly realized what it was I'd forgotten. So the most common cause in my practice of a brain disease giving psychosis is multiple sclerosis, uh, which is what I, which is the most common inflammatory brain disease in this country. Uh, and I've seen that happen a few times. Um, lupus is perhaps the most well-known one, and I don't think there's anyone, uh, anyone who's seen a few lupus cases who would deny the fact that this disease can cause psychosis. Um, the other ones are a bit more recherche on this list. So it's definitely a thing. Inflammation in the brain can present with psychosis. We know that. Um, the sort of question in front of us, and uh, this was raised by Belinda last week, and if you haven't seen her talk, please, please do see it. The question is whether the presence of NMDA receptor antibodies or one of the other members of the family of antibodies which bind to synapses in the brain can cause psychosis, and if they do, can they be treated? And I'm not going to rehearse the, the arguments that Belinda made. Uh, she presented this slide or variant of it, and uh, most people will. Uh, so I'll just briefly remind folk that this is the list of symptoms in patients who have a full-blown brain inflammatory disease, encephalitis, due to the NMDA receptor antibodies, often provoked uh, by a tumor, often an ovarian teratoma in a woman, and ending up with uh, these patients being very sick in intensive care, having seizures uh, with reduced level of consciousness. And they respond very well to immunotherapy. That's the only thing they respond to. And as part of their prodrome, their initial presenting uh, symptoms, they have often psychiatric symptoms, abnormal behavior, and they may well be diagnosed as having an acute psychosis as part of the uh, onset of this illness. So <clears throat> we uh, were the first, Mike Sandy was the first author, Belinda Lennox the last author, to um, describe a few cases of patients with uh, psychosis uh, in a psychiatric hospital setting who had antibodies in their blood that um, uh, bind to uh, brain synapses, so an MDA receptor and voltage-gated potassium channel. Uh, so this is just an association. Uh, and people have gone on and described this uh, association uh, many times. And of course, PPIP2 is the ultimate test of this. Uh, and Belinda will have shown you some data uh, to show that in a proportion of patients with psychosis, we find these antibodies more frequently than in healthy controls. So the question then is, well, um, are they causative? Do they cause a psychosis or are they uh, 
uh, irrelevant or are they somehow secondary? Do they follow on from the psychosis uh, and they're not actually driving it? And the only way that we can really tease that out uh, is to treat the uh, patients with drugs which will impact on their antibodies and see if that helps their psychosis. So we have done that in a few cases early on when we were defining the syndrome. Uh, and here's an example of four cases. Um, so you'll see that they had two months, less than two months, three months, half a month of uh, symptoms. Symptoms are quite severe. You can see them briefly described there. Uh, and over the months um, of this graph, you will see that their antibody level, which is in blue, goes from detectable to undetectable, sometimes coming back to detectable again, if there's a relapse. Um, and their modified ranking scale, which is a level of disability, and ability um, uh, mirrors uh, the impact of the antibodies on their symptoms. And that the various treatments which are in the black boxes will reduce the antibody level and reduce the level of symptoms. So uh, PEC stands for plasma exchange and R for rituximab. So plasma exchange, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is simply uh, um, kind of removing blood from a patient uh, and returning just the red cells, that is taking away the saline component of blood with all the antibodies in it and replacing it with clean saline. So you're literally washing someone out uh, of their antibodies. <clears throat> and rituximab is a monoclonal antibody that depletes B cells, the cells in the immune system that produce antibodies. So if you uh, carefully go through these charts, you'll see that there's a pretty reasonable case to be made that treating these particular patients with plasma exchange or rituximab reduces the level of antibody in their blood, and usually that leads to symptomatic improvement. Now, we went on and did a feasibility study called Synapse 1, where we simply asked, well, how possible is it to get these patients uh, who have a psychosis and have antibodies in their blood, as identified by the PPIP protocol, into a local hospital where they could either receive plasma exchange or they could receive intravenous immunoglobulin and have some therapy uh, to reduce the level of antibodies in their blood. So how feasible is that? Uh, and it turned out that it was feasible and we learned lots of lessons about uh, uh, from that experience that have gone into the design of Synapse 2, which I'll come back to. But along the way, we obviously collected some uh, data about whether uh, patients were made any better as a result of this treatment. And here you can see the, the pan scale on the left with blue, the uh, pan scale in, um, in a particular patient before and in red after treatment. And along the bottom, you'll see the antibodies that were identified uh, by the PPIP. PPIP1 and PPIP2 process uh, corresponding to that patient. So again, there's moderate, uh, open-label, uncontrolled evidence in these patients that immunotherapy helps symptoms. Uh, and if you put these data together, um, the IT group of the immunotherapy group, the no IT group, the no immunotherapy group, and you can see that um, patients who received immunotherapy did better. All very low key stuff, uh, uncontrolled and full of all sorts of potential possibilities for bias. So should we, on the basis of this, go straight to uh, treating all cases of psychosis with these antibodies um, with immunotherapy? So, I'm pretty skeptical of that. And the reason why is that we have burnt, been burnt uh, several times in the past by jumping from an observation to treatments without fully trusting the hypothesis. So uh, anyone who is uh, of the same age as me will remember the excitement that came 
with the discovery that anti-basal ganglia antibodies could be found in subgroups of people with various syndromes. Uh, so PANDAS was one of them, uh, Tourette's was another, but also psychosis. Uh, and all sorts of exciting ideas uh, were brought up to explain why antibodies against the basal ganglia would be responsible for these syndromes. And there was even a phase of treating patients who had anti-basal ganglia antibodies with immunological therapies to reduce the antibodies and hence treat the syndrome. And this graph uh, shows you the number of publications uh, in the literature on patients and studies with anti-basal ganglia antibodies in the title. And what you can see is that there was a huge vogue for these antibodies and writing about them, uh, but that has declined sharp. And it's declined sharply because it turns out the assay was terribly unreliable uh, and that the studies purporting to show an association were flawed. Uh, and this really is not a thing. This is not a thing. So we have uh, cases of diseases presenting with psychosis that people like me believe is definitely a thing. So lupus definitely causes psychosis. And we have, uh, we have things like anti-basal ganglia antibodies, which are now definitely not a thing. They're spurious observations. So the question is, in which of those two groups lies the hypothesis that anti-NMDA receptor antibodies and the family of anti-synaptic antibodies can cause a psychosis? Is it a thing or is it not a thing? And the only way to establish this for sure is to do a randomized controlled trial. Um, and uh, you'll know what that is. That's the Synapse 2 trial, which I'll come back to. So let's finish up with this case. So um, I think this, this person merits lots of tests looking for a disease that is treatable with immunological therapy, and that's what she had. And if she had found, if we had found that her ANA was positive, her EEG abnormal, MRI was full of abnormalities and so on and so forth, then I would have been very comfortable saying uh, this is lupus and treating her with immunological therapies. In fact, uh, we found no abnormalities whatsoever on any of our tests. And uh, some of my colleagues were saying, well, this is a primary psychiatric problem. Uh, I, as I've said, I don't like that language. Instead, what I would say is we found no evidence that she will respond to immunotherapy, therefore uh, carry on with conventional antipsychotic treatment, and she's returned to a psychiatric intensive care setting. Now, if we had found anti-NMDA receptor antibodies present in her serum or her CSF, and all the other tests were normal. In other words, a patient like we might well discover through the PPIP uh, to process. Well, what would we make of that? And here I think we can say that we do not know. We do not know if that is a thing or not. And so I would put that person in a trial, and this is the trial, the Synapse 2 trial. Um, uh, Belinda described this uh, last week, so I'll just point out that the treatments that we're talking about here are intravenous immunoglobulin and rituximab. They're a really effective combination for rapidly reducing the impact of any antibodies uh, present, that's intravenous immunoglobulin, followed uh, a month later by rituximab depleting the cell type that produces most antibodies. And uh, this study, which is, is painful and hard for us all to do, will be the definitive test of the hypothesis. Is it a thing or is it not a thing? That these antibodies cause psychosis and treatment with immunotherapies will improve the patient. So uh, this is probably too small for people to read, but it's a list of all the uh, people who are involved in the synapse 2 trial uh, and of course there are many many more on the uh, PPIP2 uh, study. Uh, we are all finding this difficult to do. Um, in the next few months we'll get everything restarted 
um, and we'll put our shoulder to the wheel and crack this because this is such an important question. So thank you all very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Alice, there uh, for this very interesting presentation. And um, I would then proceed straight to the Q&A session, um, which will be shared by my colleague, Isabel. So Isabel, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Alistair, for that um, very illuminating talk about the, um, the current knowledge we have from the research in this area. Um, and just a reminder for you to submit your questions via chat if you have any. Um, I have a couple of questions first though, um, Alistair. First of all, do you think there may be um, mediating factors influencing um, the presence of antineuronal antibodies and the symptoms of psychosis? Or does the current evidence suggest a more direct relationship? Yeah, I mean, this question goes to the heart of uh, what we're trying to test out, really. So uh, I'll answer in a roundabout way <laughs> by, by giving the example of um, herpes encephalitis. So that's a disease where a, a, virus, a virus enters the brain and destroys part of the brain. Now, um, when I was a, a medical student, I was taught that that disease can relapse a week or two later, patients can become unwell again. It turns out that what's happening is that uh, that damage to the brain releases uh, brain tissue, uh, which provokes an immune response, and you can get anti-NMDA receptor antibodies produced. So you can get antibodies produced as a result of another disease. But also, as this example shows, even though the anti-NMJ receptor antibodies have been produced by another disease affecting the brain, uh, they can go on and cause symptoms of themselves. Uh, in this case, uh, an encephalitis that looks a bit like herpes encephalitis. So that's a roundabout little anecdote to say that the presence of antibodies in the blood that bind to the brain can be the direct cause of the problem in front of you, it can be the consequence of the problem in front of you and not causing any symptoms directly, or it can be the consequence of the disease process and it can be causing symptoms. So it's complicated. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question we have is um, related to the current situation with coronavirus. And we wonder what the implication of delivering immunotherapy at a time of a pandemic especially considering that sometimes the uh, presentation of those with psychiatric disorders um, can lead to high risk behaviors. Mm. Um, do you have any, uh, did you have any similar cases in neurology wards? I know you outlined that young lady and how, yeah. if so, how did you manage that? Was that something that? Yeah, so I think, I think this is a really important question and please it's come up. So obviously, um, we, we uh, have been using immunotherapies during the COVID crisis in people who definitely need them. So the best example of that is multiple sclerosis. Um, and we have been considering, well, in people with MS who are on these therapies, should we reduce the strength of the therapies down to the milder drugs because of COVID? Uh, should we exclude some therapies and so on? There's been widespread discussion across Europe and North America about this. The startling and surprising observation is that young fit people on the most powerful immunotherapies for MS are not getting coronavirus any more frequently and are certainly not getting COVID, bad COVID disease, that is. However, patients with MS who are older, obese, with high blood pressure, who are diabetic, and so on, they are getting uh, coronavirus infection and COVID-19 disease badly. And the deaths we've seen in the multiple sclerosis community have nearly to a man and a woman been people who are not on immunotherapies, but are older and more disabled with comorbidity. So turning to our potential pa patient group, I'm actually encouraged by that observation because on the whole, the people that we are treating are younger and don't have those comorbidities. 
leaving aside obesity, which may be caused by antipsychotics, of course. So we are uh, restarting the use of uh, all of these immunotherapies in multiple sclerosis and all other uh, brain diseases. Um, and we are about to reopen the Synapse 2 trial. To reassure you, uh, several other trials of the use of rituximab and IVIG uh, are also opening at the same time in similar patient groups. Uh, so I think it is a reasonable decision uh, now in the context of the pandemic as it currently is to start using these immunotherapies provided the patients we use them in don't have the comorbidities that we're all aware of. Thank you very much, Alistair. We just have one more question from a member of the um, audience, and this will have to be the last one. And this is from Timia Lova. It says, are there, as there are two arms in the Synapse trial of treatment, both using antipsychotic treatment, would you consider recruiting patients even without the antineuronal antibodies present in the serum or CSF if the cases are clinically relevant? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've obviously considered this, and in a way what you're asking is that question I asked at the beginning. Is anyone with a psychosis potentially uh, treatable with an immunological treatment? And I think I've ended up thinking, I don't know what you think, that probably psychosis is such a big ragbag of different illnesses with different causes that we shouldn't do that. So we should stick to those patients we've identified who do have antibodies in their serum, however hard that makes it for us to do this trial. Thank you very much, Alistair. I'm going to pass the webinar back to my colleague, Giuliano, to finish off. Okay. Um, thank you very much, both of you, for this um, very interesting uh, Q&A session. And I would also like to thank everyone for um, taking the time to uh, participate in this um, webinar. Uh, we hope you find it uh, very interesting and useful. And you're obviously all invited to our next webinar on the 23rd of June, which will be held by Thomas Kabir and will deal with issues regarding capacity and consent in research. Um, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning of the webinar, um, this video will be soon be made available on YouTube um, for all of you to watch. And um, we will be, it will also be uploaded on our website. So once again, uh, thank you everyone for attending and enjoy the rest of your day. Mm -hmm.